He says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Christmas season forces people to deal with how they feel about being with people. And on one side, we have people dealing with difficulties going to be with families, friends, get-togethers because of the way it makes them feel. On other, the other side, you have people feeling hurt because they can't go and be with their family and friends at Christmas and they really want to. And the issue of being with people is a very significant part of what we think belongs in Christmas. But Christmas is really about God being with us. And there's nowhere in the Bible that tells us to celebrate Christmas or to do the things that we do. But it does present to us that the name that Jesus was given, the name that we bring to the forefront as we think of his coming into the world is the name Emmanuel. And the name Emmanuel means God with us. So what I want you to consider is, if Jesus' very name is Emmanuel, and if the meaning of that name is God with us, when you celebrate Christmas, do you feel like God is with you? When you live your life, does it feel like the Jesus who came to be with us is with us? And what I want to encourage us in is, that this is who Jesus is. It's not just his name, it's who he is. And so each of us should be able to expect that that is the way our relationship with him is going to feel. It's very significant that this is the name Jesus was given. It's his identity. And that the name that meant so much to Joseph and Mary, that he, this was God with them, and to the shepherds and the magi, this was God with them, that it's supposed to have that same effect on us, that just as the shepherds came and they knew that God was with them, that you and I should be able to do that every day. And it should be something we can say, I want to feel like God is with me. And the name of God gives us that hope. The name of Jesus gives us that hope. So, as I've been thinking about how people are affected by the Christmas season and that for a lot, the Christmas blues come over us because of the expectations of people, the expectations of whether we are with people or we aren't with people. And there's something about God being with us that brings healing to the wounds we've experienced from people when we were with them or the way we feel when we can't be with the people we want to be with. The fact that God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ actually brings healing to that. So let's take some time to really look through the meaning of Jesus' name in reference to why do so many Christians live like God isn't with them? How can we actually have this, not just in the warm fuzzies of the Christmas season, but in our whole lives? This prophecy starts with the word, Behold. And that word is an attention-getting word. And I want to encourage you here. The behold is saying, stop what you're doing and pay very close attention to this because this is the most significant thing that you have ever heard, that God is with us. That this little child in the manger, this little boy talking to the, the teachers of the law at 12 years old, this man who went around teaching and healing people, who died, who rose again, who ascended to the Father, all of this is, get your heart on this, God is with us. And if your life feels more like it's still the effects of God not being with us, this is what the good news is. Jesus coming in to a people who didn't really know what it was like to have God with them, and God giving him this very name that God is with us. So, take notice. Behold, the time has come. The Prince of Peace has arrived. Pay attention to it. I believe that this is something that God is bringing to us to get our attention. It's like God sending a word to tell people who are lost in sin, I'm coming to rescue you. The prophecy that was given here, this was given hundreds of years earlier. It was like God speaking 
throwing a lifeline into a prison camp and saying, people, I'm coming to rescue you. So when Jesus came for Joseph to be assured of what was happening, the angel said, Joseph, remember when God threw this lifeline into the prison camp and said, I'm coming to rescue you? That is why Mary is pregnant. That is who the child is. His name will be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is what was being spoken of. The time of your redemption is here. And so you and I can take this and say, wow, God has spent so much time giving prophecy after prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus came so that when it happened, you and I could say, there's absolutely no doubt that God wants to be with us. Jesus coming into the world is the evidence that God wants to be with us and that he wants us to be with him. He wants us to have this feeling of he is with us and we are with him. Why did God create the whole universe? It was to give man a place to live so he could have a creature in his own image and likeness that he could be with. He made a garden where he could walk with man. When Satan ruined that, God immediately said that the offspring of the woman is going to fix it. He will crush the serpent's head while the serpent crushes his heel, which Jesus came to do on the cross. He, he crushed the serpent's authority over us, took away the power of sin, but he was wounded on our behalf. All of that is saying God wants to be with us. So the name Emmanuel is God deliberately choosing the name by which he wants you to know him because that's the way he wants to be known. He wants you to be able to live your life feeling like he's with you. It's the name he chose. You have his authority to say, God, that's Jesus' name. I'm not going to ever be satisfied unless that's the way I feel. So what do you have to do in my heart to feel like in my total being, Jesus is with me, just like that name signifies. The name means God with us. Many people debate the identity of Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's just a man? Just a good teacher? This name says that Jesus is God with us. When we talk about the identity of Jesus, even though we can see he became a man, he did not stop being God. He was God with us. I remember as children, and I'm sure you've heard stories of kids' clubs and Sunday schools, where kids can win contests for memorizing the most words of Scripture and yet never be converted, never actually know the Word of God. So at Christmas, Jesus came as God with us, the Word. He didn't come to give us the Bible so we could know the Bible. He, came as, he gave us the Bible so we could know Him. And so, if you turn to John chapter 1 and keep thinking of the fact that Jesus is God with us and how well are you experiencing that, but John 1 verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is the Word, he was with God, and he, he was God. He is God now with us. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So here we're introduced to Jesus as the Word. The Word, if you think of God, he's invisible. He doesn't have human form. He doesn't use human language. He... he does not use language the way we think of it. So, language is enabling people to find words that we can put out for other people what's on the inside. The purpose of words is to let you know something you can't see, which is what I'm thinking or how I'm feeling. I have to use words to explain to you, this is what I'm thinking, this is how I'm feeling, these are things I want to do. Jesus is the Word of God. So, He is the person, the Word, who comes to communicate to us what the invisible God can't communicate to us, because He's invisible. 
So he gives us his word, which is his son. And it's kind of funny, we talk about people keeping their word, and you think, that is so small compared to God's word, which is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, with us. And he comes as the expression of God. He is the word of God. And it's very important the way John shows. He was with God, so the Son is distinct from the Father, but he, he was God. So when he came, he was God with us. And then uh, John 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So in Matthew... Gabriel tells Joseph this prophecy from the Old Testament that his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. John says, and the Word, who was with God, who was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. He is God with us. And you and I have to be confronted with this, that this is the Word of God who is with us. It's not the Bible that's with us. It's the very Word of God, the living Word, the person of God, who is the image of the invisible God, the Word of the invisible God, so that we can know Him as God. So when the shepherds were called to Bethlehem, they didn't go to read the scriptures, the words. They went to see the Word. When the Magi came, they came to Jerusalem and the elders, the leaders of Israel, looked through the word and told them, oh, he will be born in Bethlehem. They didn't stay in Jerusalem reading the word. They went and found the word of God. Paul did not teach us to simply know the words of Christ. He says we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, that personal experience of the thoughts of, of Christ. We're told that we can have the peace of God, the very peace. Jesus said, I, I don't give you as the world gives, I give you my very joy. All of these things to say he is God with us, and our lives should feel that way. The third word in, in Matthew one twenty three is us, God with us. I'm dealing with that first simply to see who are the people persons involved here. The one is God, that's Jesus. He is God. Who's the us? Well, in a general sense, we could say that the us would apply to Israel. This was a promise to Israel under the first covenant, and so the angel could tell Gabriel the name of this child that Mary is, is already growing within her. He is God with us. So the Jewish people could look back and say, all these promises of God are about to be fulfilled in this child who is God with us as the Jewish people. And of course, even with Jesus' disciples, they had trouble realizing that that wasn't the full picture. But they did understand that. God is for us. He's for the Jewish people. These are our promises. We have the patriarchs. We have the promised land. We have the covenant. And now we have our Redeemer, our Messiah. But we have to look way beyond that and consider in John 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, who was a Jewish religious leader. We often forget that John 3.16 was part of his conversation with a Jewish religious leader. So when Jesus was saying, for God so loved the world, he wasn't coming from a North American evangelical mindset of that means God loves everybody. He was coming from a a Jewish mindset who thought that God loved Israel. And he's telling uh, Nicodemus, you have to be born again and God loved the world. God doesn't just love Israel. He loved the world. He sent his son because he loved the world, not just Israel. So when we look at God with us, even though Joseph probably would have understood that as, yes, he's here for Israel. It actually doesn't mean Israel, it means us. It's general, it's people. God has come to live among us. And so, we can say, God so loved the world, and so he sent his son to be with us. In a more specific sense, the Bible teaches that God is with the poor in spirit. 
So it, it's not so much who he's with in the general sense that he was with everybody in Israel, but it's more who actually are the ones he's with now. Because he isn't with everybody now. Even at Christmas, people will sing uh, some song about Santa Claus and then some song about Jesus as if they're both the same. But people don't live like Jesus is with them. So those who actually can say, God is with me or he is with our church, are those who are p poor in spirit, those who humble themselves. In Isaiah 57 verse 15, uh, something that is very clearly continued in the New Testament. This was already made quite clear. Isaiah 57 verse 15. <clears throat> For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Someone once explained that contrite is the picture of taking a mortise and pestle, putting something in there, uh, a mineral or an herb of some sort, and crushing it until there's not one grain connected to another. There's not one fiber connected to another. That contrite is that sense of being so crushed of pride that we have absolutely nothing in us that says, oh, I could do that. But it's actually utterly, utterly destroyed, ruined in ourselves. That's what Isaiah said when he saw his vision of God. I am ruined. He didn't have one thing he could say, I'm almost ruined. If it wasn't for the fact I was born a Jew and, you know, he didn't say that. He said, I'm ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and he knew he was ruined. That is what contrite is and yet God says, I'm in the high and lofty place. I'm holy. I'm raised up above you. My thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are above your ways because I'm holy, but I'm also with the person who is lowly and contrite. And that's why there's so much hope in the gospel. God is with us. He's with those who are lowly and contrite, no, not those who are keeping the law and proud of themselves for how good they are. In Matthew 21, uh, as we get on into Jesus' ministry, Matthew 21, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 21, verse 31. Uh, I'll just start with the second part there. I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Here Jesus is saying that the prostitutes and the tax collectors were coming into the kingdom through faith, just as they were taught, where the religious leaders were staying outside the kingdom because they had so much pride in their own ability. So, who was Jesus with? Which ones could say, God is with us? Now, the religious leaders might say the words, but they certainly couldn't have the experience the religious leaders were missing out on God being with them because they simply could not see who he was. Where the prostitutes and tax collectors could see who he was, and through faith, they came and experienced the kingdom. And I'm showing that because a lot of us think, well, God can't be with me if I'm still a bad person or if I still do bad things. Well, the issue is, do you have faith in him? Not have you straightened your life out, but do you have faith that he can straighten your life out? Do you have a pure heart in the sense of you've given up trying to do it yourself, but you now absolutely believe that he can do it? Because he is God with us. How could God with us not be able to do it? And so God is calling us to have faith that he is fully able to do what he has come to do. Mark chapter 2 and verse 15 
says, And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. That's an amazing picture. And you and I have to say, if when Jesus was here as God with us in the flesh, and even the prostitutes and the tax collectors were reclining at the table with him while he was having his dinner, and they could have a sense of this is God with us, that you and I have to say, well, we can certainly have that today. We should have a sense of getting up in the morning and feeling like, I'm able to be with God, just like the prostitutes were, just like the tax collectors were, just like the drunks were. If they could feel God with them, I should be able to have that as well. When we go through the rest of the New Testament and we see that Jesus went to see a Samaritan woman, we're given an account of his conversation, it's so that you and I today could say that's what it looks like for God to be with us. When Jesus called Zacchaeus down from the sycamore tree, it's so that you could say, that's what it's like for God to be with us. That's the way it should feel like in my life, that I get up in the morning, he's calling me to his word because he's God with us and wants me to know what it feels like to be with him. All these things, a Gentile woman coming to Jesus with her demonized daughter and the disciples tell her to go away because she's bothering him or them, Jesus rebukes them and welcomes the woman and heals her daughter to tell people, I'm going to be with the Gentiles as well. And when a Roman centurion comes and, and sends word to Jesus that his servant's dying, it's so that we could see this was not a Jewish man. This is God with us, meaning anybody who puts their faith in him. We can look at a disciple who denied Jesus three times, and yet God was still with him. We can look at a very religious man who later called himself the worst of sinners and yet talked about how I don't live any longer. It's Christ living in me. I have God with me. We probably don't have a lot of difficulty with who God is. And we probably don't have a lot of difficulty with who us is, who we are, who the people are that Jesus hung out with. It's the with. What is it about God and us that should be described as it's God with us. Not God far away watching over us. Not God staring down at us with anger on his face. But God with us. The shepherds who came to see Jesus saw God with them. The Magi, Anna and Simeon in the temple, Joseph and Mary had God with them. We need to consider that all of this is to show us what it is like for you to say God is with me. So when Jesus told us, wherever two or three people are gathered in my name, there I will be among them. Why is he saying that? It's so that when Christians come together, that we can say, if even just two people come together, in Jesus' name, he will be with us. He will be in the midst of our meeting, sitting with us. He is God with us. When Jesus began telling his disciples that he would be sending another helper, he was preparing them for the fact that he would be leaving and the Holy Spirit would be coming. It was because we needed God with us. And Jesus simply could not be God with us everybody. As the church was going to grow, Jesus could not be with everybody. So another helper was sent who could be with everybody. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent, so that every single church could have God with us. Right now, uh, all over the place, there's churches meeting. Every church that's gathered in Jesus' name has God with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I love what John or Jesus said in John 14, verse 18, where he's telling the disciples about the Holy Spirit coming. And, and he says in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I think it's fascinating. For a brief moment on the day of Jesus' death, they would feel like orphans, that their one hope, they believed this was the Messiah, and he's gone. 
And Jesus is saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so he came to them. But then the Holy Spirit had to come so that we could have God with us everywhere. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus tells us to make disciples and, and baptize them and teach them to obey God, he says, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. Well, what did he mean? He meant that in the person of the Holy Spirit, he himself would be with us as God. And that it would be more real for us to have God with us in the Holy Spirit than the shepherds coming and for maybe an hour or two hours or a few hours had God with them. But then they went back to their sheep. They may never have seen Jesus again. Uh, maybe they did 30 years later when he began his ministry. But the point is, you and I have God with us in the person of the Holy Spirit like nobody who met Jesus in his earthly time ever had experienced. And so instead of us looking at the word and thinking, wow, those lucky people way back then, we should be saying, wow, look at us. We get to have Jesus with us inside us, we get, get to have meetings where Jesus is just as much with us when he was in this house and the, the tax collectors and the sinners were all there eating supper with him. We can have him with us. Colossians 1 verse 27. Colossians 1 verse 27. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How is Christ in us? By the Holy Spirit. We don't just say Christ is preparing a home for us. We say Christ is in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. The Holy Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing that the the work Jesus is doing to prepare a home for us is going to be finished and we're going to go and be with him. But now it's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Why do so many Christians live without hope? Because they don't feel Jesus in them. They don't feel like Jesus is in them, which gives them the hope of glory. And so I'm basically encouraging us and challenging us, please pay very close attention to the name of Jesus Christ because his name means God with us, that's the way it should feel for you. And one last scripture is John chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. And I want to show this because there have always been three different responses to God being with us. John 1, verse 9 to 13. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. So the first response to Jesus is that the world simply doesn't know him. He was God with us. The world doesn't know him. Secondly, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now that means Israel. He came to his own people, the people that had been promised that God would send a Messiah. He came, they didn't receive him even though he was God with us. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, to all who did receive him, to who, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God because he would not leave us as orphans. He gave us the right, the privilege, the, it's right in the covenant that those who believe in him have the right to be the children of God. If any of us have been Christians for a long time and we're feeling like, I don't know God that way. I don't feel like God is with me. The issue in this is, is Jesus' name enough for you to say, I want that? Can we see that is his name? That is his person. It's who he is. I believe that many of us have worked our way through life with that God-sized need to feel God's love and acceptance being filled with people. And those people have failed us and we have nothing. 
But the name of Jesus Christ should give us this hope that he's God with us. If he fills up the God-sized part of our lives, where this God-sized need to be loved and accepted is never satisfied by any amount of people, no matter how many we throw in there, then we could see if God is taking his place, if that God-sized need for love and acceptance is met by God with us, God with me, well, then I can handle when people don't like me. I can handle when family gatherings don't work out because nobody likes me, or I can handle when I can't go to be with family at Christmas time because God is with us. So, the Beatitudes make very clear we don't start by saying, God, I can do this. I can know you like this. This We say, God, I don't know you like this. I want to know you like this. We go from our poverty to hungering and thirsting after something we can't possibly give ourselves. And then God gives us what he alone can give. And then we will have that experience of saying, God is with me. I get up in the morning. God's with me. I missed my devotions today. God's with me. I had a bad day at work. God's with me. I had a really good time in the Word. God's with me. Church kind of sucked today. God's with me. Wonderful worship time. God's with me. It's all the same because of who Jesus is. And it's his name. It's his identity. Get to know him that way. Amen. Amen.